This is the City of God podcast, where Christ meets culture. Welcome to the City of God podcast, where we are weekly exploring today's biggest cultural issues through the lens of God's infallible word. I'm Rob Pacienza, and as always, joined by my co-host, John Rabe. Great to see you. Great to see you, Rob. I'm excited once again to be with you and another outstanding guest, another outstanding program lined up today. Absolutely. Today, we're joined by Dr. Bob Barnes, who is the CEO of Sheridan House Family Ministries, a ministry that has existed for, I believe, five decades uh, in the South Florida region. Yeah, 50 uh, years now. Absolutely. Uh, Sheridan House Family Ministries is a ministry that we support at Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church, uh, but their ministry is to single moms. They're, they have a counseling ministry, and they have homes for boys and girls here in South Florida to give them a uh, it, it, an opportunity uh, to restart and to uh, have an opportunity to be educated, opportunity to really understand what it means to be a young man and a young woman in a culture that is absolutely confused and chaotic. Usually come these children come from broken homes, and they they put them in a Christian environment for several years with mentors and father and mother-like figures that can uh, really help pour into them. And it's a, a ministry that is blessing uh, families and our region uh, for, as I said, for over 50 years and, and grateful to hear from Bob today. And for those outside of South Florida, which is probably the majority of people uh, watching and listening, the thing to understand here is that Sheridan House is an institution in South Florida. The work Absolutely. that they do is so highly regarded across denominational lines, across religious boundaries. Uh, make no mistake, they are a Christian organization and proceed upon Christian assumptions and biblical truth, but it is just a widely respected organization here. And the thing about Bob Barnes is, is that the man is just a font of wisdom. If you go to a Christian church in South Florida, you know who Bob Barnes Absolutely. is because that's how widely his influence extends into the churches here. Definitely. In he's not only CEO of Sheridan House Family Ministries, but he's also an ordained Baptist minister. Mm -hmm. He has filled our pulpit. He has filled pulpits all over the South Florida region. He's a mentor to pastors, but but this is personal for me mm. uh, because he's been a mentor to me for several Several decades. He's been a father like figure to me, uh, taught me early on what it meant to be a man. Uh, taught me what it meant to be a father and a husband uh, and and what it means to love your wife as Christ loves the church. And so I am indebted to this man, not only indebted to the ministry of Sheridan House, but to Bob Barnes personally. And we had the opportunity to pick his brain on uh, various issues, such as the importance of the family. Uh, we really do believe that family is the foundational sphere in a flourishing society. Yes. And uh, we, not, we need not look to the state. Uh, we to dare not look, dare to, not look at, yeah. uh, to the state uh, to understanding, uh, you know, what it means to be a, a flourishing society. We need to go back to the foundational principle that the family is the the centerpiece in a flourishing society. So, talked about the importance of family, the importance of family values. Talked about gender and sexuality uh, and identity issues that the next generation is is facing, and what does the church have to say about that? Uh, protecting the next generation, and really the importance of the church coming alongside the children and families. This was an important discussion mm -hmm. uh, because we do live in a culture where even the Christian families um, are outsourcing discipleship and education to the church and the school. And Bob had an important word to say concerning the family recapturing its role as the primary educator and the primary discipler of the next generation. And I think a particularly important word for fathers, you talked about how he really taught you to be a man. He taught me fatherhood in an indirect way as well. Uh, I didn't know Bob well, but he had an enormous influence over the people who were my pastors when I was a young father. And he, the thing that comes through in this conversation that, that I learned from him is intentionality and in fatherhood, the importance of making decisions that, that these things don't just happen when you raise children, that you have to make decisions about how you're going to do this. And it didn't come naturally to Absolutely. him. And he unfolds how all of that yep. came to be. An intentional husband, an yes. intentional father, 
an intentional pastor. So let's hear from Bob Barnes, my mentor, my pastor, and uh, our guest today on the City of God podcast. So we're joined by Bob Barnes today, CEO of Sheridan House Family Ministries. Thank you so much for being on the City of God podcast. Oh, it's an honor. Thank you. So in leading Sheridan House, for those that might not be familiar with the mission and purpose, explain a little about the history of Sheridan House and why it's so important. Sheridan House has been around uh, for 54 years, and um, we started with one boy's home in Hollywood, uh, middle school, uh, high school boys who were, had had to be placed in a halfway house because of their behavior, skipping school, running away, and they basically live at Sheridan House except they go home Friday night and uh, come back Sunday and they go home with a prescription of what they need to accomplish um, on the weekend. And if they don't accomplish it, then they've got a lot of grass to cut uh, when they get back during the week. And the parents are required to show up for the meetings, the parent meetings. Uh, and if they do, then they pay very little to have their child there. If they don't, they pay $2,800 a month. So no one misses parent meetings. And then, uh, and so we have now several uh, boys' homes because we've moved to a 60-acre campus on Flamingo Road. And uh, we also have a counseling center uh, staffed by 11 licensed therapists. And also here at Coral Ridge, uh, we have two of our therapists here. And uh, then we have uh, a single mom village. We work with about 260 single moms a year. Oh. And... Uh, it, it, that's so much fun. And we have a village where they come and live. And uh, thir we have 13 units now. We're building four more units uh, this year. And I hope we never stop building those. They live with us for 24 months. And uh, they pay rent every every single month. And when they leave, they get all the rent money back. Mm -hmm. They've got to go for budget training uh, uh, during the during the month, parenting training, uh, all kinds of different training. And if they come, if all the single moms come to the uh, single mom seminars, which we have once a month on our campus, they have access to our to our food store and clothing store. We get a truckload of groceries every day from Trader Joe's, and uh, it's unbelievable. And we have tons of clothes when a clothing store like a Talbot's or whatever, has something that's been on the shelves a long time. They'll give it to us. People give us their clothes. People give us their cars. We give away two cars every month to single moms who need a car. So our our ministry really is we just want to help families. We just want to come alongside families and, and help them. And especially these little boys. We have a little boy, not so little. He was with us years and years and years ago, and he came to us making all Fs and uh, two Ds. And uh, But we could tell he was smart, and he was very rebellious, huge huge child and a single mom and he lived in the children's home and he was there uh, 18 months uh, you don't leave till you finish what you need to accomplish he left us making all a's went to hollywood hills high school making all a's uh and all state tackle uh because he got really big got a full ride at the university of massachusetts and then got uh, drafted by the miami dolphins mm. and that's because god got a hold and he would say god had a plan for me yep and so our job is just to come so many stories things. like that from Sheridan House. Oh, it's amazing. Well, I feel bad because they fly in from around the country and yeah. ask me, how do I do it? And I say, actually, I don't know. I just kind of sit here and write Bible <laughs> studies and he does all the rest. Yeah, yeah. it's got, amazing. Yeah. Well, and people, uh, we have sort of a, a national audience that listens to us. People hear us all over the country. So those who are not here in South Florida, those who are not here in Broward may not recognize just what an institution Sheridan House really is here every Everybody in South Florida knows about Sheridan House and the work that, that you guys do over there. As you said, a 50-year-old ministry, you've been here not the entire 50 years, but a, a substantial part of it. Yeah, <laughs> I'd say that's a, a 49 50 Since before Rob was born. Yes, 98% yes. <laughs> of its history, I think, if my math is correctly. Oh. So, uh, But what, what have you seen change over the years? How is ministering to families, or maybe it's not, but are there differences in ministering to families and what their needs are now as opposed to in 1974? I think f family, especially extended family, is disconnected right now. Well, it didn't used to be as disconnected. Mm. For instance, in the past, there's no parents that would let their single mom daughter be on living in her car. Yeah, it's just really, really changed. Now, to, to get real ethnic, one of the cool things is the Latin community has changed us. Mm -hmm. uh, they are into family, and uh, it's so funny when we interview an Anglo boy to come in uh, to the program. It's mom and dad, 
or maybe just one. If we interview a Latin family, we have to use a much bigger room because everybody comes and everybody has questions and everybody's a little upset uh, that it's come to this. And I now know why God built such a beautiful campus. The children's homes, you know, they're just gorgeous, multi-million dollar homes, each one. And I was a little concerned when the contractors, who several contractors each took a home. And when they built the homes, they built them too nice. They competed. And now I know, especially for the Latin family, because they walk in and say, oh, I can do this. Mm. I can do this. But family, Family, I think, and I read a journal article the other day that starting post World War II, uh, we forgot what family was, uh, because women went into the workforce during World War II and didn't come back out of the workforce for the most part, and so we forgot, and so we forgot how to parent, and we're having parents who weren't parented; uh, they were managed. They, uh, they were managed, and now we've got children who aren't parented. Uh, they're shuttled from activity to activity to activity, and they, you know, they don't know how to do chores. And chores are an important part of raising an adult, having them do chores. And um, I didn't pay my children to do chores, but they did chores. And I did give my children an allowance because I wanted them to learn how to handle money. Mm -hmm. But Roby and Tori each had something they had to do every morning. And if they uh, didn't get it done, they didn't have a fun afternoon. And so they learned and they pick, picked it up and they went after it. And so I think we really have a, people raising children that don't know how to parent. What's mm -hmm. the, they don't have a goal. What's the goal? And the goal is raise an adult. Right. That God can use. That's good. And that's discipline. I have to have personal really good. discipline mm -hmm. um, when I become an adult because uh, there's just so much distraction from Satan. And then you add to that the cyber world in a child's life. And parents don't know what to do about that. I was speaking at Memorial Hospital to the staff. And uh, during the Q&A, one of the physicians, I found out he was the head of some surgical department, said, can I ask you a question? What do we do about my, ch what, what do we do about my child's mobile phone? And he said, well, the first thing you need to do is you need to realize it's not his, it's yours. Mm. It's not his mobile phone, it's yours. Mm -hmm. And you, you need to limit it. And so, uh, and in all the cyber world, we had an interesting thing. I think I've told you this, Rob. Uh, I looked out on the basketball court at Sheridan House, and I saw the biggest man I've ever seen out there playing with the boys. And I walked out there, and it was Shaq. He lives up against us, basically. And he rode his bike, saw the little boys. And he, only eight of our boys were out there, but he saw them. Went out and played basketball. Mm. And it was just amazing how fun he was <laughs> with the boys. One boy couldn't make a shot of, for anything, so Shaq just carried him around the whole time. <laughs> but he came to me and said, I want to watch by every one of your boys a laptop. Mm. And I said, well, this isn't all our boys. And he said, I don't care. I want to buy every one of them. Well, you can't buy it for the boy. You have to buy it for his mom. Mm. Wow. She needs to own the laptop. She needs to own all the cyber world and, and make sure she's watching it and yes. what he's looking at. Yeah. So that's, it's, a, it's, it's a time when we don't know how to parent. Yeah. Yeah. If people don't uh, want to find out more about Sheridan House, where do they go? What's the website? The website is uh, Sheridan, uh, um, SheridanHouse.org. SheridanHouse.org. Yeah, just go on SheridanHouse.org. Yep. Awesome. And yeah. and everything that Bob's talking about, it's amazing. Uh Unlike, really, I mean, I think you you, knew, you alluded to it, John, so many people in our region know about Sheridan House, but mm -hmm. it's amazing how Sheridan House draws not only the Christian community together, but the non-Christian community together. Oh, yeah. And uh, yeah, restaurants and businesses, oh. they want to support what God's doing at Sheridan House, because I think even deep down inside of every individual, whether they believe in Jesus or not, they, they understand the foundation of family mm -hmm. and how that is critical to a flourishing society. And I know Sheridan House um, ministers to everyone, yes. uh, regardless of religion, regardless of the boys part, not the not the single mom part, right? But the counseling part and the boys' homes, uh, they uh, they come from all different backgrounds. But the single moms we work with basically have to be referred by their church. So why? So you're driven by the gospel, driven by the love that God the Father has for you mm -hmm. through Jesus Christ. And that informs and influences your values, your ethics, kind of your ministry and mission and purpose in life. Yes. Why, why is the Judeo-Christian worldview so important and how it speaks to family values? Why is that so important, well, particularly today in cultural oh, moment? Yeah, it tells us how to do life. Jesus tells us how to do life. And I was talking to a husband uh, last night who's very upset with his wife, and she's asking him to 
be involved in something. And I said, I got to give you a verse, man. Husbands love your wives as much as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Mm-hmm. I mean, what kind of a sacrifice did he make? Everything, the yeah. cross. Yeah. Gave yeah. Himself. And so my job is to realize, and this changed my marriage, 50 year marriage. My job is to realize I'm married to the daughter of the king. And so I need to love Rosemary as much as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And so but one of the funny things about that, and I talked about that in the Bible study this morning, is Rosemary, wanted, when we were first married, she wanted to talk all the time. Yeah. When, when you get home tonight, can we just sit and talk? <laughs> and I wanted to say, can you give me the list of questions so I can get ready? Yeah. And Do when a little you prep, say, yeah. yeah. When you say tonight, is that 7 to 7.30 or 7 to 10 or what is it? Because I realized I didn't know how to talk. Mm-hmm. And what happened was we ended up uh, talking and writing a book about talking that a publisher said, well, we want that book. And we were just kind of taking notes yeah. because I, I grew up in a home where my mom died when I was a kid. And it was my dad and my brother and me. Guys don't sit around talking. Mm-mm. But God knew I needed to be rescued by the wisdom and sweetness of Rosemary. So, And, and in the humor of God, he definitely has you marry your opposite. Yep. No uh, on time, people marry late people. Uh, morning people marry night people. I mean, the list goes, talkers marry non-talkers. The list goes on and on and on. And I remember the first few years of married, and I've been married 50 years now, but the first few years, me asking God, we're so different. How is this going to work? Mm. And uh, I know he's, the angels are looking at him, bursting out laughing. Uh, <laughs> but this is for you, Bob. I didn't do this at you. I did this for you. She's good in areas you need help. Mm. Opposites. Yeah, that's good. Mm. That's good. So the Lord gives us the family, and this family structure really is, uh, you know, you talked about how people don't know how to parent anymore. People don't have any basic concept of the family structure anymore. Right. Your marriage is optional. Um, parenting is optional. With uh, with abortion, you can just as easily decide. Everything is just sort of a lifestyle choice so now. Sad, as it, but, so sad. So, yeah, when, when, but let's, I, I, Rob, I think, rightly pointed out that people do still have a you know, the law is written on their hearts. They have sort of an intrinsic resonance with what you do because they value the family, even if they live in a culture that has taught them the family doesn't really matter anymore. Um, but what is the actual importance of the family? For those who don't understand, why is a mom, a dad, uh, kids, you know, a, a living in that community, why, why is that important? Because we see it under such attack and we see it breaking apart in ways that we never saw 50 or 75 years ago. Well, it's so important to God that we shouldn't be surprised it's being attacked. Or, that's right. But it, you didn't have to think through this 50 years ago. You had a family-owned business or you had a farm and everybody was together and the mm. kids went out and got the egg. I don't know what you do on a farm. I grew up in New York City. But <laughs> kids, kids went out and got the eggs in the barn and I think that's it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so the, it, the family was needed for that, for the family-owned business. And uh, I, I think the, the deal here is we're not sure why. And it's it's we need to be family for the sake of our marriage. Mm-hmm. And um, we need to be uh, family for the sake of our children because they're watching. They're learning from us. And my dad was a master at this. Uh, my, my mom never washed a dish in her life. And we washed the dishes. Mm. And we, he taught us to serve our mom. And she didn't like that too much. She wanted to be mom and she wanted to, and I I remember hearing them kind of discuss it. And my dad says, no, 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 the boys are going to serve you. So they'll learn to serve their wives. Mm. And uh, I thought, wow, wow. Okay. I get it now. So we, this is the foundation that we go out on. And so many have to retool their foundation, which I had to do because I didn't grow up in a Christian home and never went to church. And I had to really, really learn. uh, And I was a little humiliated at first realizing I'm learning from my wife. Mm. I'd like to be the smart one and she's the smart one. Um, but all of a sudden we get it and we didn't have children for seven years because we knew I had a lot of growing to do and learning to study my Bible and then learning to study it with her and realize we are here to serve each other. Uh, and Jesus show us how that works. And even though it's interesting, even though we're opposites in so many areas, we both have Bible studies. She has a two women's Bible studies. I have uh, three men's Bible studies. And so Although hers has 120 and mine have 45. <laughs> I, I don't know what that is, Lord. Um, but I, I, it's what he wants to grow us with mm. and grow us and grow us. I had two little ones come in, two 30-somethings come in uh, after staff devotions a couple Mondays ago. And uh, both of them newlyweds. And they said, 
do you have more words than most men? And I said, what does that mean? Well, you talk before the, when people were asking you, what'd you do this weekend? And I said, uh, well, Rosemary and I basically sat in front of the fireplace uh, every afternoon and evening just talking. Mm. And she had something she wanted to read me and talking. So do you have more words? I said, no, I didn't have any words. <laughs> but she taught me. Mm. She taught me when she wanted to read a marriage book uh, with me, a Christian marriage book by Ed Wheat. And she uh, said, can we read a marriage book uh, on, on Thursday nights? I said, I remember thinking, could we do anything more boring? But I didn't say it. And she came out, and the little girls were looking at me, these 30 somethings and she came out the first Thursday night in a nightgown with the marriage book. I would have read the encyclopedia yeah. or a dictionary at that point. Yeah, smart on her she, part. She, yeah. she owned me as a visual male. And it was it just was a life changer. It was mm. a life changer. He wants us to be developing each other's lives. Mm. Yeah, oh, you're absolutely right. I love what you said. I mean, we should not be surprised that it's under attack. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, uh, that, that the state is not foundational to society. And, and even the church, before there was a church, nope. there was the family. And I think sometimes even the church has to be careful that they don't take over the responsibility that ultimately belongs to the parent. Now, there's some cases where the church is the parent in the sense that, mm -hmm. you know, there's a single mom that doesn't maybe know the word of God and doesn't know how to do discipleship and they need to come alongside of the children. And, but I see so many families and parents basically outsourcing education to the school, yeah. discipleship to the church. And I think we need to do a better job as the people of God saying, no, the parents are the chief disciplers. The yeah. parents are the ones that are raising the children and don't buy the lie of culture oh, and society yeah. that you don't matter. Yeah. Right? We, and we have to teach parents how to do that. Yeah. Uh, what's important? I mean, I read the Bible. Uh, in fact, you were there a couple of those mornings. I yep. read the Bible every breakfast to my kids. Uh, I didn't come up with that idea. Rosemary said, I think you need to read the Bible every morning while the kids are eating breakfast. And I said, no, I think you need to do it. They, we started when they were four. And she said, no, you need to do it. And this is not her. She's not aggressive at all. And so I, I would read, you know, five or six verses from John chapter one, and then say, anybody have any thoughts or comments? And uh, pretty much for about a decade, no one had any thought or comment at all. And Rosemary would weigh in and I'd weigh in. Uh, but they're both in the ministry today. Yeah. Mm. And it, it's, I, we did a thing on TBN, Roby and I, years ago uh, for Father's Day. And they read that couple, I can't remember their name. They were interviewing us and they said to Roby, um, wow, you and your, he was killing me in this interview. It was hilarious. He's about 20, <laughs> 21 years old. Um, and they were dying laughing. They said, obviously you and your dad are very close. And he said, yeah. I said, why is that? Well, my dad drove me to school at Westminster Academy, uh, er every morning and we had 45 minutes to talk and we never carpooled at all. It was just us talking. And I remember thinking, yeah, we talked about the Devo we just did, the, the mm. verses we just read. And the funny part about this was we get back on the plane to fly back to South Florida. And, and I said, you're kidding me, right, Rob? You tilted the seat back the minute you got in the car and went to sleep. <laughs> He said, well, I just can't talk as much as you can. <laughs> uh, a little a little background. So I grew up with Bob's son, Roby, best friends, yeah. Westminster Academy. And let me just say, the, the Bob you see in public is the Bob you see in private. Mm -hmm. And he taught me mm -hmm. what it means to be a dad. Mm. Uh, that there are boundaries mm. uh, and th that uh, the, the the head of the home leading his family through servant leadership yep. and loving his family and loving his wife well, um, uh, watching you all do devotions around the table. Uh, yes, there will be curfews. Yes, we will know exactly where you're going and who's going to be at that party. And uh, what a moment we need now in our cultural moment oh. where we need dads to be dads, yes. uh, that we need families to be celebrated and we need the family as God's designed it to be something that is uh, looked at, not as something that's archaic and antiquated, uh, but something that is critical to a flourishing foundation uh, for our society. Oh, yeah. And let me say, I showed up at those parties. Yeah. I would drop them off and they knew that I had given them five things. If it happens at the party, call me, I'm coming back to get you. Uh, you know, alcohol shows up, people are m making out, whatever. I can't remember all five now. And if I come in and see that, It'll be two weeks before you go anywhere. Yeah. And uh, Roby got it. Tori, unfortunately, has my personality and pressed it <laughs> yeah. and pressed it because she's really awesomely strong and pressed it. And when she finally got it, she got it to the point of this. Her senior year, uh, she was at a party. Uh, I shipped Roby out to Dan Gossett's house, and I had the house alone and the fireplace with my wife. I'm very excited about this. And there's a knock on the door at about 9 o'clock at night. And I thought, wow. And I went, and it's Tori and six kids. And I said, Tori, what's up? Oh, Dad, they brought some beer over. 
over to the party, and I said, well, let's go. We're going. And so they all came. One of the guys is a huge guy on the football team at Westminster. And I said, uh, Eric, how did she get you in the car? She says, Dr. Barnes, I don't know. All of a sudden, she said where we're going, and we're all going to your house. <laughs> so I, I, you have to you have to back up what you're telling them, yes. and yeah. you have to teach them it's time to walk away because they're going Absolutely. to college. they yeah. got to know when to walk. Definitely. Yeah. You, you taught me what it meant to be a parent first and a friend second. Yep. Mm. Yep. Your first and primary calling is to be their parent. Yeah. You know, that was yeah. a hard one for Rosemary. That was because she has such a gentle heart. But uh, and it's even funnier as a grandparent. Mm-hmm. We had Roby's all three kids uh, this past weekend uh, for two and a half months. Uh, actually, just this weekend, but it seemed like two and a half months. Right. <laughs> and uh, she, she as a grandma, has lost all ability to, of structure and discipline. She just keeps saying yes, and she keeps looking over at me, and I say, no, you can't have another whatever that is. And it's, it's been interesting watching grandma. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I promise I don't want to try to get you in trouble here, but I do want to ask you, you know, we, we live in Why a time. I trust you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no one does. It's okay. Uh, <laughs> but you, you're Sheridan House ministers to, to teenagers a lot. Yeah. And there's no question that, that teenagers are, are in the midst of this onslaught right now. And uh, particularly, frankly, when it comes to issues of, of sexuality and gender, they are really facing something. And there are a lot of studies that show, for instance, that this transgender notion is really a social contagion. In other words, one person will, one girl particularly will start to feel that she's transgender and suddenly her entire friend group will begin identifying the same way. Right. So there's a there's a way that this sort of spreads socially. Um, how do you deal with, how do you minister to, to teenagers in a culture that is so aggressively poised to attack things like uh, whether, what a male or a female is and what sexual orientation is supposed to be and so forth. Well, first of all, I would have to listen to Pastor Rob's sermon from this past Sunday. Yes. (laughs) Knocked it dead. Um, But I, I think this... Children, especially teens, desperately need somebody to talk to mm. and have nobody. Grandma's not down the street. Mom and dad are busy. They have nobody. Mm. So people approach them in school. And if you come out transgender in public school today, you're a celebrity. Yes. Everybody's cheering you. And so mom and dad, number one, uh, and, and let me say this, it's going to make some people feel guilty. I wouldn't have my children in public school. Mm-hmm. Wow. I could not afford Christian school, but I did it anyway. Mm. And I will never forget uh, Ken Wackus after. I did chapel at Westminster Academy, and he took me across the street for lunch. He says, why aren't your kids at Westminster? And I said, I can't afford it. I'm in the ministry. And he said, what can you afford? And I told him, he said, you're in, mm-hmm. and changed my life and changed my kids' life. I would not have my kids, and I honestly believe we're going to see the end of public schools as we know it and many, many, many more Christian schools. And But what we also have to do is we have to find a time to open up our child, my child's brains and talk. You know, for me, I would sit on the side of each child's bed at night. Uh, Roby, I'd lie down with them. Tori, I'd, lie, I'd sit on the floor with my head back on her bed and just ask her questions and listen and listen and listen. Mm-hmm. And it took months and months before they're finally talking. And Tori would save up talking for then. I want them to have somebody who they can and put it out on the table. And I didn't want to be staring her in the face. That's why I'd lie down on the side of her bed and she's behind me here. I wanted her to feel it's, it's a little safer in the dark of a bedroom. And we just talked and talked and talked and talked and talked. And uh, it, it was amazing because I wanted to open them up. And I think that's one of the reasons they have great marriages today because they know how to talk. Our kids know how to talk. And all of this is is intentional. I, I think that's oh, something yeah. that men really need to understand. This doesn't just sort of fall into place. It doesn't happen accidentally. It's not a function of personality. Well, some people are just better at that sort of thing no, than I others. Wasn't. Yeah, I had to learn. It, you have to decide to do this and then make it a, a priority in your life. And I'll never forget, I, we had to put Tori to bed early because of something she did. And Rosemary said, you know, you need to go sit on the sit on the floor by her bed. And I remember thinking, I so don't want to do this. I had such a rough night with her. And she was about 10. And so I went because I I knew Rosemary was right. And I went and sat on the side of her bed. And she rolled over against the wall, facing the wall, because uh, she was mad at me. And then finally she rolled back. And then I'm talking, and she's not talking yet. And then finally she went down the edge of the bed, opened up this little drawer, and pulled out this bag. And I wonder what it was. And it was a bag of barrettes. And she filled my head with her barrettes. I had all these barrettes all over <laughs> my head. And she's giggling, and we're doing okay, mm. and we're talking. Uh, I have to teach them how. 
to talk and slowly over a period of time, you know, they'll ask the real questions. Mm. Yeah. And the other thing we need to talk to them about is their sexuality. Uh, we wait too long. We wait too long. When they're little, we get we have the right we use the right name labels for body parts. Yeah. Uh, we don't have these little nicknames for body parts. And then slowly we talk to them about okay, this is what this is for. This is what happens, and it's really really hard to do that with your children, mm. and and continue and continue so they can ask questions and teach them to be. You should be proud what Jesus has made you. But Jesus has made you this. He's made Roby. He's made you to be a boy. So he wove you together in your mother's room. Psalm one thirty nine. He knows. His plans for you as a man. Tori, he knows his plans for you as a woman. Don't miss this. Mm. And I, I think we need to not wait till all of a sudden we have a problem. Yeah. We need to keep the sexual discussions open. Mm. And there's a there's a book called The Wonderful Way Babies Are Made that is a great book to read with your kids. It's been out 50 years, and, uh, it's, and it's been upgraded and upgraded. But it's a great book to sit on the couch, you know, one evening after dinner with both kids and read it. Mm. And then when you put them to bed, so what would you think about what we read today? So it, we, we have to be at the forefront of teaching them about their sexuality. Yeah. Absolutely. Along the same lines, uh, one of the hot topics in our country right now is parental rights. And I hate how political it's become oh, it's because for the church, this shouldn't be a political issue. This That's is right. a deeply moral issue. Right. So what would the call, your call to the church be concerning how the church needs to stand up and celebrate the family? according to God's design mm -hmm. and do everything possible to celebrate in advance uh, the, the call to protect parental rights yeah. in our nation right now. Why is this so important for the church? Well, it's so important for the family. It's important for the church. And I think the church needs to see probably, yes, we need to have great children's programs. Yes, we need to have great youth programs uh, so they can be together with most, most of them Christians, but we need to have programs for parents mm. to help really intelligent, highly educated parents who don't have a clue. Yeah. You know that no means no, doesn't mean let's argue. Mm. No means no, and if you do that again, you say that again, you come back at me again, you're going to bed early, yeah. and I'm doing this because I love you. Parents need to be probably, and it's just my opinion, our number one uh, part of the family for us to go after because they're educated in so many ways, but not parenting. Yeah. It's not parenting. Yeah, that's good. Before we wrap up, I would like to ask you about another aspect of your personal ministry. And again, people listening outside of South Florida wouldn't necessarily know this, but it is the case that here in, in South Florida, if a church, uh, if their pastor leaves, if unfortunately, heaven forbid, but we've seen it happen far too often, their pastor falls and has to resign. If, if one of these things happens in a church, in an evangelical church in South Florida, there's a very good chance that Bob Barnes will be their uh, pastor for a period of time, will fill their pulpit for a period of time before they find a full-time pastor. That's really a, a, a long-time ministry that you've had to come into churches that are in transition, that are in crisis frequently. From doing that, as you have faithfully done that, what do you find are the needs in churches today, perhaps the, the holes that need to be filled or the, the, the difficulties that you see happening? What, what are the things that you find in churches that are really needed today as yeah. you come into yeah. ones that have crises often? Well, let me first say, uh, yes, I was an interim in 22 churches, but I'm done. Okay. I'm, okay. Sit, I'm sitting next to Rosemary Barnes uh, in church now, uh, listening to my son preach. Praise the that, Lord. That, but 22, 22 churches is a lot. Yeah, 30, <laughs> yeah. 30 plus years. Um, but I, I think churches are afraid to make necessary changes. Mm. And I think the old guard, the, my age group, doesn't want anything to change. And everything changes. And the, the person out there who's looking at church, it changes. I think you've got... Rob here at Coral Ridge, the, the perfect balance. I don't know how you pulled it off. You've got a traditional service and you've got a contemporary service. And when we come up here, the big family argument on Saturday is she wants the traditional service because she doesn't get to hear hymns. I want the contemporary service because I never heard hymns my whole life. And uh, but you you found the balance. I think I think we need to know our community. And I think we need to reach out to our community and not just, and we need to know it's not my church, it's his church. Mm. And as we see him doing things, you know, it's, it's a Sheridan house. When they, they came in from a church in Chicago, a big church in Chicago, spent the day, wanted to know, how'd you come up with these ministries? And I said, don't come. I didn't come up with these ministries. God did. And um, 
they gave me a word. And so uh, they said, well, the single mom ministry, for instance. I said, you know what? In the old days, I used to, we had one boy's home and three other employees, and I was the guy who went and got the groceries, free bunches of groceries from Publix every Monday. And I would go get it, and word got out that we had groceries, and two single moms came and asked for groceries. Would you share them with us, too? And I honestly, I didn't want to, but I knew I had to, mm-hmm. um, and because we were so poor back then. And then uh, I got a call f- from Beverly. I won't give her last name, but I still remember her, and this is 1975. And she came to get groceries, and I gave her groceries, and I'm wheeling them out to her car, and there's no car. I said, Beverly, where's your car? And she said, he didn't, my ex didn't make the payments and it got repossessed. Uh, Do you ever get cars donated here? I said, no, not really. And I flippantly said, you pray about it. We get a car, it's yours. That was 10 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock that afternoon, we got our first car. Oh, wow. (laughs) And called her and said, we got a car. I don't know how to do title stuff, but we'll figure it out and I'll keep you posted. I went home and told Rosemary and she said, you do know you're in a single mom ministry, right? I go, oh, because she was a noticer. She noticed. And church leaders need to be a noticer. What's God doing here? Mm. What's happening here? Mm. What's going on here? I remember in one of the churches, um, we did the single mom toy store uh, the Saturday before, a week out from Christmas, and gave people cards to hand out to everybody who they thought might be a single mom, cashiers, whatever, come to church, and then you get three free gifts for each child. And uh, hundreds came to church. And I still run into people who say, I I came to the toy store as a single mom, but I also came to Christ. I'm one of the ones who came forward at the altar call. We need to be noticers. And single moms, you're right. Single moms is the biggest issue today. It's amazing. And quite honestly, if I had a church that wanted to do a toy store, we'd give them all the rest of our toys. We get about 8,000 brand new toys every year. And because it draws them. We have to, Jesus, I think, saw the visible need to meet the real need. Mm. He saw them that were sick and lepers and whatever. He met that need to meet the need of heaven. Yeah. Well, we're doing a big push on Mother's Day here at Coral Ridge for uh, the single mom ministry at Sheridan House. Thank and you. Gra- grateful to be a part of that. And I just want to thank you on uh, behalf of our church and our ministry. Mm. Uh, thank you for your leadership um, in, a, in a society and culture that uh, diminishes the value of the family. Mm. Thank you for standing strong mm. for decades in our region and throughout our nation, upholding God's, fam- God's design for the family, your ministry to boys and to single moms, the counseling center. Uh, I pray that the favor of God is upon you and you. Uh, you, you get a deep, deep sense of satisfaction for how God has called you, but how that calling has been fulfilled. Well, Rob, I'm just a noticer. He's doing it all. Yeah. But Amen. thank you. Absolutely. And thanks for being on the City of God podcast today. Thank you. Thank you once again for listening to the City of God podcast made in partnership with the Institute for Faith and Culture. This is a weekly podcast, so make sure you check out all previous episodes on our website, cityofgodpodcast.com. You can also find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere you listen to podcasts. We video record each and every podcast each week. So make sure you check out the video version on our YouTube page. Please pass this podcast along to any friends or family that are interested in exploring today's cultural issues through the lens of God's word. I want to thank you once again for joining us, for tuning in, and may God richly bless you.